Greetings, everyone. John, so good to be with you today. Thanks, Steve. Our task is really to try to disaggregate one of the most uh, fraught debates in the world right now, which is how to trust what used to be the most trusted institution, which were news and media organizations holding governments accountable, holding corporations accountable. And we're now, uh, as many people say, we have an election uh, in the United States going on today right now, which very much is uh, in part about this, which is about the fake news phenomenon. You sure. are CEO of one of the largest PR uh, uh, firms in the world. Uh, and help shape and sculpt communications for lots of players. And I'm just interested in how you frame the fake news challenge in this time. Well, Steve, I, I think the first thing is to keep some perspective about it. Uh, while fake news has taken on an incredible new momentum, particularly since 2016 and events in your country, the United States, where I live currently, um, but it's important to remember that fake news has been with us for a very, very long time. As long as media has existed, it's just that the scale of it is um, so much bigger than it had been heretofore because now with the advent of the internet, it's become much more easy to, um, to, to uh, communicate fake news on a global level, whereas in the past it might have been restricted to London or Lisbon or wherever it might have been. But it was but there, it was there. That's important yeah. to realize. That. But it, 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 I think it always has been there. You can go back to in the early days of at least the founding of the United States, and we had scandal sheets and we had called scandal mongers. They were the early, sure. you know, handwritten bloggers of the time. But, but the, as you said, the scale is huge. Tech companies and social media platforms have helped create that scale. So are you blaming them for the, for the challenge today? No, not, not, not at all. Should technology be blamed? Not at all. No, I mean, well, I think that, I mean, clearly with the advent and, and the creation of these mega companies, mega platforms, we've had for perhaps the last 20 years, in fact, I believe that this week is the 20th anniversary of Google search, for example. And, right. uh, but in that time, the, uh, the industry has grown up to an extent. And I, now I think is the time for it to become adult in its behavior as well. And by that I mean, I, I think we're rapidly coming to the end of the day when um, for so many of these platforms, it's kind of like the Wild West. And I, I do think that we are going to see uh, we are going to see the arrival of regulation in different parts of the world. Uh, there's going to be a new paradigm, new relationship between government and the platforms in a way that the platforms have been more or less able to do what, what they've wanted in the past, and that's now um, going to change. But I think what they have created is marvelous and, and has been hugely to the benefit of mankind. But I think we have to be really careful, and particularly what so many people have observed over the last couple of years, and particularly what happened in the elections in the United States, that in trying to set out to create something really powerful and for the benefit of the human race, that we don't end up creating a Frankenstein. You know, John, I've read in de great detail your story, and uh, uh, raised in Ireland, uh, built a, a big public relations firm, became in, as part of Fleischmann Hillard, and you've ascended to be the CEO of the global um, operation. And I know that you believe in firms and purpose, that you believe in uh, uh, conscientiousness and, and doing good. And, and some of us look at PR companies as not moral in that sense, that, that there are a lot of bad guys in the world and bad countries that have PR agencies helping them. How do you navigate in that world? Because you're also, the, the communication sector is also part of this question of what people can trust or not. And I'm wondering, do you put yourself at a disadvantage versus an amoral PR agency that's willing to flack for anyone? Or do you have standards? Well. I have to tell you another story first. You know, back, back in Ireland, we had this wonderful employee whose father was a very famous Irish journalist. Um, and, and he was really upset about the fact that she, he was in journalism, but she'd 
gone to the dark side and was working in PR. And she told me one day, she said to her father, she said, don't worry about me, Dad, because um, no matter how bad it is working in PR, we're always one step above journalism. So uh, that was her take on the world. So we might, be, we might be down at the bottom, but maybe we're with journalism some, somewhere down there. Right. But I, I, I mean, my, my late mother, who just died recently at the age of 87, 80, just 88 recently, she always said to me back in Ireland, John, if you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. And we as a firm, um, we believe we are highly principled in terms of the advice that we give to our clients. Um, and we also then, more importantly, we need, we need increasingly to walk the walk with our, with our own people in terms of what we are, um, uh, the, the stands we're encouraging our people to take. I mean, just very recently, we, we became one of uh, 350 or so firms in the United States to take part in a huge campaign encouraging people in America to get out and vote. I mean, one of the, one of the issues in America, and, and particularly for the campaign 2016, there's only about 35% of Americans are voting. And young people don't realize the importance and how they can change the agenda. And so people have not been voting. So, I mean, one, I, I was talking with somebody senior in Google when I was out in Mountain View recently, and they were making the point to me that they've been doing campaigns in support of getting people to vote. And in America, if people register to vote, if they register to vote, and sometimes that can be really difficult, there's a 95% chance they will go on to vote. And, and one of the very pleasing aspects of what's going to happen throughout today, and it's been happening in the, 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 the early voting that's been going on in the US, the numbers are up so significantly. Huge. And, and among young people as well. And on all sides, people are coming out to vote. And that's really I mean, anxiety popular. is high. And when anxiety is high, people, people are, are getting out to sure. vote. And I, you know, I ask you that, you know, uh, my friend Eli Pariser wrote a book a few years ago, some of you may know, called The Filter Bubble. Uh, and Eli's point was that you can surround yourself with books and movies and friends that affirm the views you have, that, that, that you can create a bubble on its own. And, and if you go onto Amazon and buy one book, it can tell you what other 10 books you're likely to do. Um, and at least in, in our country, uh, that, that plays out in terms of the current day politics that people... Are. So I'm interested in this question of fact, right? So we're talking about fake news, in fact, but sometimes something that plays in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, where my family is from, uh, is going to feel very different than if you were in New York City or in Boston or an urban area. And I'm wondering to what degree, what, what would you advise for bridging these worlds better than we're doing today, yeah. where gravity just feels like it operates differently, that truth feels to be filtered and screened differently. And what may be true for a worker in Oklahoma who's had a tough time for various reasons may be different than someone who's had a tough time with circumstances in New York or who's done very well. Well, it's a long time ago now since Mark Twain said that the great enemy of prejudice is travel. Hmm. And, you know, at this stage of my life, I, I would just say to everybody in the audience today, please just get outside, get beyond your own bubble, and particularly if, if you're getting most of your news online. The danger is that we are all only getting news that continues to feed into our own, perhaps either our, our prejudice or indeed our unconscious bias. And when I moved from, I, I, I lived most of my life in Ireland, I spent five years in the UK, and then for the last three years, I've been living in St. Louis in the Midwest of the United States. And for an awful lot of people in America who come from, say, San Francisco or from the East Coast, they regard the Midwest as, they talk about it rather patronizingly, as flyover country. Yet the, the, the middle of America is where so many of these political decisions and outcomes are, are, are coming from. And I'm, I'm incredibly grateful personally that mm. I've been given the chance to live in America because I have learned so much that people in that part of America who've got deeply conservative values and who are utterly charming people, they think in a very, very different way. And I, I was doing a town hall with our own staff in San Francisco recently, and I was saying, you know, most of you come from a position that would be regarded in America as somewhat liberal. But I said, be really careful when you're giving advice to clients that you are 
um, you're giving that advice based upon having really, really good data, but also understanding about where that client comes from. What is that client's real perspective on, say, um, gun control or a range of, of other issues, and not be just giving your personal prejudice and, and, and uh, because that's not healthy. And we, ne we need to get beyond that. I mean, I, I, I sit at home in the evening time in America and I flick between CNN and I go to Fox and I go back. And I can remember w w one evening um, when, when uh, America had pulled out, out the, the Paris Climate Agreement and, and you, you, you go to CNN and CNN and say, this is one of the worst things that has happened in America in the past decade. And you go over to Fox and it's telling us the best thing that has happened. And it's very different worlds. So very different world. And I, and I, you know, I just wish that both entities would get back to a stage where they're giving us facts, rather, rather more fact and rather less opinion. So I'm trying to imagine, you've been, you've been CEO of Flyspin for now, what, about two years? Just three years, actually. Three years. So year. you had three years under your belt. And I'm just imagining, let's go back and say we made you CEO 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and you were able to talk to Mark Zuckerberg back then, or Jack Dorsey at Twitter, yeah. or some of the other big platforms that obviously had PR and communications advice these many years before this all began to blow up. And I'm interested because we have so many tech entrepreneurs and people um, uh, uh, at all different levels in the tech ecosystem. What advice and counsel would you have given them then to get some of these questions right? How do you begin to build in a North Star on some of these important social equations issues, particularly about fake news, that was not baked in before that should have been? I, I think I, 10 years ago, it's a great question. I think 10 years ago, I would have struggled. But now, with the benefit of hindsight on what, on, on what I'm seeing now, I think that I mean, if you look at the population that's here in this hall and at this conference, um, what the tech world, and I, you know, I don't profess to be in the same league as people who are listening here in terms of uh, tech qualifications, but the tech world is bestowed with people with outstanding IQ. And what I have observed over the last period of time is that there is a real deficiency of EQ in that world. And, and I, 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 I think it behoves people who are creating great startups and great companies that you can't just turn your back on the world and say, you know, it's my, my platform, I can do whatever I like. I think, the, I think having values is incredibly important. And I think that, um, you know, in fairness to Zuckerberg, um, I think that he has learned, and he's learning very rapidly, um, that uh, Facebook cannot just stand aside from society. It is part of society, and now that it's growing up, and it has to deal with regulators, um, and it has to deal with an increasing, increasing sentiment that so many young people out there are really, really disappointed about how the extent of which Facebook was manipulated during um, the 2016 campaign, and now people are saying to Facebook and the likes, we, you know, we, 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 we want you to take steps to prevent this kind of thing happening again, because this is incredibly important for our um, democracy. So I, I but I, I do think that um, the, uh, as a sweeping generalization, I think that the tech world um, could benefit a huge amount by in a greater infusion of those coming from a background of where they have a higher level of EQ. Do you know, um, I just want to commend you. I read an interview where you talked about inclusion and diversity in your workforce, and you talked about this can't just be about numbers, this can't just be about welcoming African Americans into a white person's world or about women. It has to be an inclusive, broad game. And one of the areas I'm, I'm struggling with myself is whether that means in, in terms of uh, uh, political identity as well. You know, we have a divided nation. We have uh, a, a country that sees things in really different ways. Do you think companies, particularly in the tech sector, need to diversify, I, I, I hate to call it their, 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 their political framing, but essentially find ways to bring people into the mix that reflect a greater balance than we do today? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that it's really important not to think about people who have different political views I mean, I'm Irish, and you know, we have a particularly strong view on what's happening in relation to Brexit at the moment. 
um, and we find it hard to understand why uh, people would want to leave the European community and all that goes around that. But it's really important. You know, God gave us one mouth and two ears, so as we spend twice as much time listening as we do talking. And it's really important to hear what the other side has to say. And, you know, one of the experiences I've had in, in St. Louis is that I can go out on a Wednesday night for dinner with four absolutely delightful people who think that Donald Trump is doing a magnificent job, and the following night I can go out with four equally delightful people for dinner who think he's the worst president of all time. How about getting them all together? And yeah, yeah, well, I, I, that's the thing. They're not coming together. Mm. And people do need to come together and to be respectful and to be able to talk about the, the issues. And we right. all have to work really hard at right. that because it's just too easy to retreat into a room where yeah. we are only with people who think the same way and, as we and do. And just in our last minute, John, I'm interested in what the John Saunders playbook in, in just one minute is in reestablishing for brands, for companies in this fake news environment. What are a few things that you tell everyone that ought to be at the top of their list? Well, I think it's really important, Steve, to get ahead of the agenda. I think that you know, for those companies who think this will never happen to me, you know, fake news will never be an issue for me. I think it's really, it's never been more important to put down a stake in the ground, find your authentic self, find your authentic voice, stand up for what you believe in, and every time you see anything in the world that's happening that you believe is fake, call it out call it out and it's there's no longer it's no longer a time where CEOs can sit on the touchline in the way they did in the past um, whether we like it or not we now have to be center stage and our employees are expecting us to voice an opinion ladies and gentlemen John thank you for joining us yeah, on the panda stage John Saunders CEO of Fleischmann Hillard thank you very much thank you so thank much you. thank you thanks a lot